afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back, and I trust you found the panel discussions and the sessions attended so far useful and thought-provoking. We still have some policy briefings that will take place after the end of this plenary session, and with around 70 ministerial delegations here in Doha, WISH is providing a tremendous opportunity to influence and to shape health policy. Now, this morning, some of you will have attended the panel discussion on health professional education. And in an era where there is tremendous emphasis for understandable reasons on universal access to healthcare, there are still many questions about how the health workforce would meet the demands of that increased coverage. Our next keynote speaker is the architect of a remarkable program of access to healthcare in Mexico. It reached more than 55 million previously uninsured people, and it happened while he was the Minister of Health there. At the World Health Organization, he led the team tasked with evidence for policy making. Today, he holds many distinguished roles, including president of the University of Miami. Please welcome Dr. Julio Frank. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Um, excellencies, distinguished guests and uh, colleagues, I want to start by thanking uh, my dear friend Lord Darcy for this invitation and the opportunity to be here, and uh, his entire team who have very competently taken care of my uh, needs to be here with you today. Um, I want to spend uh, the next few minutes discussing with you a dimension of uh, innovation that's deeply linked to health, and that's educational innovation. That is another arena of innovation. And this, is, this morning we were hearing about health and education as the two pillars of development. Well, I'm going to talk exactly about the intersection between those uh, two pillars. Because I'm going to talk about innovations in education of health professionals for universal health coverage. And I want to talk and cover two main topics. First of all, to discuss with you why this is a time, a unique time of great opportunity. And second, then very briefly and at a very broad level, talk about the dimensions for a new strategy in terms of the way we think about educating the professional workforce in health. So let me start with why, why this is a special moment. Um, let me take a step back. Uh, in 2010, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report, of 1910, which shaped the medical education around the world, uh, the Lancet convened one of the Lancet commissions on the education of health professionals for the 21st century. I had the great privilege of co-chairing that commission with my colleague Lincoln Chen, and we published the report called Health Professionals for a New Century in the Lancet. That was in 2010. Subsequently, there's been a lot of work, and of course, today here at WISH, uh, a report uh, of a working group led by Tim Evans uh, has been released. Uh, but basically, the point is that we are at a unique moment for educational innovation because we are witnessing the convergence of three big forces. First of all, unprecedented advances in the learning sciences. We understand better than ever before how humans learn. That is coupled with a massive change in the nature of global demand for education. And that change is both quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative piece is that thanks to the MDGs, to the Millennium Development Goals, about a billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the period between 1990 and 2015. And a lot of those people are now aspiring to have access to post-secondary education. And like in health, in education, we're victims of our own success. As more people have access to primary education, one of the original MDGs, uh, we increase the demand uh, for post-secondary education. And a big part of that is in the health professionals, as I will argue. But the qualitative change in the nature of demand has to do fundamentally with the incredible changes in the labor market. There has never been a period of such intense change in the labor market in general because due to the advances in automation, a large number of jobs are being displaced or replaced by machines, and a large number of new jobs are being created. And as I will 
argue this has enormous implications for the way we organize education. Finally, the third mega trend is a series of technological advances. For whatever reason, education was one of the very few fields that did not experience a technological revolution in the 20th century. Compare it with healthcare and medicine, compared with transportation. We arrived to the 21st century still basically with no major technological breakthrough since the invention of the printing press by the Chinese and then reinvented by Gutenberg. Basically, we are now living that technological revolution, as I will argue uh, in, in a moment. So they, you have that convergence of three mega trends that I think uh, that are forcing us to rethink how we approach education. So what has changed since that report was published in 2010, this brief six years? First of all, there's been an explosion of interest in educational innovation. And this is happening at universities, but it's also happening at ministries of health around the world and other ministries. 2012 was declared the year of the MOOC. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Courses. And that was the year when uh, out of Stanford University came two entities, Coursera and Udacity, out of Harvard and MIT came uh, a, a, another large uh, initiative, and a large number of universities around the world started focusing on this so-called massive open online courses. The idea, as I will explain in a moment, of huge technological leaps forward in the technologies we use for teaching. The other big change has been the um, consolidation of an, a movement for interprofessional education. And there's now a whole collaborative around interprofessional education. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, we are now seeing the actual implementation of educational reforms for universal health coverage in a number of countries. Uh, very, uh, in, 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 in a large number of countries, many of them are represented here. So this is what creates this unique set of opportunities. Now, let me talk briefly about what would be the dimensions for a new educational strategy as we think about universal health coverage. And that new strategy, as we argued in the Lancet report, has two main dimensions. We need instructional and we need institutional reforms. So let me start with the instructional reforms. There's a big, big strategic shift in which I'm talking here of post-secondary education, but you could apply this to almost anything, but especially post-secondary. Think mostly about degree-granting institutions, typically universities and colleges. We have had what I call a tube vision of universities, right? It's a tube, it has an entrance on one end, that's admission, and then there's an, uh, uh, there's an exit at the other end of the tube, that's graduation, and we pretty much assume that something good happens to people while they're inside the tube. And so going to university is something that happens, in our case, to health professionals, you know, anywhere between 18 and 30 years of age, and then you're done with it. That vision is completely obsolete now. Because of the very high level of, of change, of dynamism in labor markets, we need to embrace an open architecture for universities and other post-secondary education institutions. An open architecture where people will come in and out of educational institutions throughout their entire work life. And this is more than the traditional concept of continuing education, in which you basically keep yourself updated in your own discipline. This is reinventing yourself as the conditions in the labor market change, as automation advances, as task, task shifting maybe takes place, Whole, and whole new uh, professions get created. And we need to redesign universities to have this open architecture. But it's also open in the sense that the old paradigm that you first study theory and then you go out to the real world to apply it is also obsolete. We now know, thanks to advances in cognitive sciences, that practice is the source of a lot of learning. So we, universities need to be open so that students start having immersive experiences from day one. And, and, and that's a big part of what this new uh, educational or, or instructional strategy will require. So this leads to a number of uh, very important principles. The first principle is we need a systems approach. And as I said before, we're talking here exactly at the intersection between the health system and the education system. Uh, and this is what happens. And we need an education system that is responsive to the needs, but it's also critical, not 
passively responsive to the needs of the health system, but can be a, a source of critical analysis of what's needed, the reforms that are needed in the health system. And we need both a quantitative balance and a qualitative fit. We have focused a lot on the quantitative imbalances. The report released today uh, by WISH documents you know, a shortage of uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 15 million health workers in the world. Huge quantitative imbalances. There are many countries, I'm sure many of them represented here, were in the same country. You have villages without doctors and doctors without jobs. So major quantitative imbalances. I want to focus mostly on the qualitative fit. How do we assure that not just we get the right numbers, but we get the right types of doctors, nurses, and other health professionals. So the, the instructional redesign principles start, first of all, with principle number one. We need to shift to competence-based learning. And competence-based learning basically puts the curriculum on its head. Instead of starting with a curriculum that we assess how well students learn to that curriculum, we start with an assessment of the health needs of populations. And this is the link with universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is nothing if it doesn't satisfy the health needs of people. So we start with an assessment of needs, and then you work your way back. You then deduce from those needs what are the set of services or entitlements that will actually meet the needs of people. Once you have those sets of entitlements, you derive the equivalent in terms of the mix of health workers, both professional health workers like doctors, nurses, dentists, and others, and non-professional health workers like community health workers. And then you derive the curriculum. It's a complete, differently, completely different approach to the way we have designed curricula traditionally. That is, it requires, would require a mix of a breadth of competencies, including the ability to work as teams, and then the depth of knowing a lot about a particular field. So that's the first big principle, competency-based learning. The second is the need to move to flexible and modular designs. If we're going to have lifelong learning, learning around the entire work cycle of people, it's, we've got to move to mo modular uh, uh, models where people will acquire different competencies around along their entire uh, uh, career in, 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 in the health profession of their choosing and of their initial choosing and whatever health profession they may evolve to, uh, to as the labor market changes. The third principle is the principle of engaged learning. One of the exciting things about the new technologies is that this has nothing to do with the old style online learning which was, you know, basically recording someone delivering a lecture. Uh, we need to move to, and we now have the technologies to uh, develop engaged learning. Engaged learning has three main components. It is active. Active is the relationship between the learner and the pedagogical material. It's interactive. It's the relationship of the learner with the faculty and with other colleagues. And it is personalized. And just like we talk about personalized medicine, we're moving to a world of personalized education where we can actually modulate, in a modular approach, competencies to the needs, the evolving needs of people. Uh, uh, so the idea of self-paced learning, uh, where one is relating the learning experience to one's own educational needs. These are, um, again, very different approaches to the more rigid way and the more passive way that we are used to, to learning. And the, the good news is that the new uh, online platforms actually allow one to do that, as I will mention in a moment. Finally, <clears throat> uh, uh, there's the question of, well, given those new online technologies, you know, is that going to replace face-to-face -face interaction? In the Lancet report, we talk about three levels of learning. And this is, I think, a key concept. There's informative learning, formative learning, and transformative learning. Informative learning, as the name implies, is about the, the exchange of information. That's a very important part of education, but it's not all of education. In informative learning, we produce experts, people who know, who have the information and the skills that are required. But that's not enough. In health, we need to go to formative learning, where in addition to information, we socialize students into a set of values, particularly an ethic of service. 
And that's where you're not only an expert, you're also a professional. A professional is an expert who has adopted a explicit code of conduct where you have a service orientation. That's very important, and that's part of the educational experience, but it's also not enough. We need to, the, to move to the highest level, which is transformative learning, in which now you become not just a, an expert and a professional, but a change agent, and you develop leadership competencies. And what that means is that increasingly, health professionals must master not just the content, the technical content, but also the context, the larger health system in which they operate. And again, if we're thinking about health reforms for universal health coverage, we need health professionals on the front lines that actually understand and adhere to the values of a universal health coverage. Well, <clears throat> what we have, sorry, uh, what we have learned is that what works best is a blend of online and on-site uh, platforms. For informative learning, online platforms are actually pretty good. In fact, they're often better than face-to-face -face because high-quality, engaged online education can actually deliver better results. But as you move to formative and transformative learning, the face-to-face -face interaction becomes very important. So what we need is a, an integrated instructional design that combines on-site, meaning in classroom, online scenarios, and then in the field, as I was saying, through immersive learning. Finally, let me just say a word about inter- and transprofessional education. The dominant model has been that, you know, health or students have a common pre-secondary education and then go to university or college and then quickly go into the separate silos to study medicine or nursing or public health or other health professions. But then when they go to the world of practice, they're expected to work in teams. But there's nothing in their educational experience that actually developed the competency. The competency to work in teams is actually a competency, an educational competency. So in interprofessional education, you actually, part of that horizontal set of broad-based cross-cutting competencies is to learn to work in teams and appreciate other perspectives. And I would add that we also have the imperative of developing transprofessional education, which means the engagement with the non-professional part of the health workforce, particularly community health workers. For example, competencies, cultural competencies, understanding different cultural and interpretative frameworks that maybe the non-professional part of the workforce will uh, uh, adheres to, and that if you're really going to work as a team, in the effort to universal health coverage, that becomes absolutely critical. In health, we have, of course, interprofessional education within the clinical professions, the professions that actually deal with patient care. But we also have with the public health part of the workforce, and then increasingly and very importantly, interprofessional education with non-health professionals. Uh, <coughs> all the other professions that deal with some of the social determinants of health and that are very critical to enlist in the effort. Are, and, and it is an extension of the concept of interprofessional education. Let me finish by quickly talking about the institutional challenges because you know, many of you are either in ministries of health or in universities, and we know that these are complex institutions. And I would say that the institutional strategy has to deal with three Cs, and I call them colleagues, capacity, and culture. Colleagues refers, of course, to the faculty. The problem we have is that most people who actually are teaching the next generation of doctors, nurses, public health professionals, and other professionals don't know how to teach like that. I include myself in that group. We all need to reinvent ourselves in order to be able to uh, deal with these new forms, these new... Uh, ideas that have come out both uh, out of the advances in the cognitive sciences and the new technological platforms. So probably our biggest challenge is, first of all, to deal, first of all, with the quantitative scarcity. In many of our countries, there are not enough people devoted to the education of other professionals. In the Lancet report, probably the most shocking finding was that out of the five and a half trillion dollars that in 2010 the world invested in health, Less than 2% was devoted to the education of health professionals. 
And when you think that those health professionals are making the decisions around the other 98%, including what services to be delivered, how they are delivered, how do we organize, because, you know, all of you who are working in ministries of health, you are actually health professionals. You went to universities, you got your degrees, and all of us have, uh, have been educated in an, old, uh, in an old model, and our teachers were educated like that. So it's not just the educators, it is the, the, the need to reformulate education, starting with new faculty, the faculty development. That's the first thing. The second theme is capacity, and that starts with the learning spaces. You know, we need to completely redesign classrooms so that they are allow for engaged learning. Uh, probably connectivity will be more important than blackboards in the future. Pedagogical material, that's a, a, a photograph of uh, the, all the new possibilities in uh, simulation. Uh, simulation is a great way of learning from mistakes without hurting anyone. Uh, and because humans do learn a lot from their errors, uh, we, we need much more of, uh, of uh, high-level uh, simulations. By the way, these, are, these offer an opportunity for leapfrogging by developing countries because um, it is much more expensive to practice on people and actually harm people than to uh, establish good simulation uh, labs in, in, in uh, educational institutions. And then we have all these new technological platforms uh, like uh, the MOOCs, and they serve first the purpose of improving access to knowledge. In my prior institution at the Harvard School of Public Health, we developed the first MOOC at that university. It had 55,000 learners from around the world. The largest group outside of the United States was from India. 18,000 people from India took this course, a very high-quality interactive course uh, dealing with epidemiology and, and biostatistics. But in addition to providing ac improved access to knowledge, these new platforms allow for enriching the educational experience by flipping the classroom and allowing the lecture to take place on an online platform and then using classroom time for much more of simulations and other forms of immersive learning where students actually get immersed in the practice and learn from practice. And then finally, and very important, these new technological platforms are an instrument for global engagement. I think if, if, if any of us in this room believes that every one of the 194 member states of the UN is going by itself to develop its full complements of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, public health professionals by itself, that's not going to happen. And I think in an era of global interdependence, we need to develop institutional formats where we develop consortia of uh, universities and colleges and other forms of, institu of uh, educational institutions around the world to collaborate in, 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 in developing those, uh, the necessary complement of health professionals in each country. This is the great promise of these platforms, the possibility of rethinking universities from something that's fixed in place, that's only serving uh, a, 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 you know, a, a limited population that has access to actually open and allowing and liberating this access to knowledge from around the world. But we need to think of new forms, as I say, mostly around the figure of consortium. Lastly, we will need a cultural change. We need to talk differently about, uh, about education. We need to think of this as a core part of, of that intersection between the education and the health system. Um, I was saying in the, uh, in the session we had, in the panel we had this afternoon, that when we talk about uh, universal health coverage, we very often focus on the hardware, the technologies, and the facilities, on the software, the administrative and clinical procedures, but we tend to forget the humanware. And we need to have a major change in the way we talk, in the values we have, in the rewards we have, in the identities we develop, that values the fact that at the core of every health system, at the very core, what you have is the encounter between a group of people in the population who have a defined set of health needs and a group of people, also members of the population, who have been educated and socialized into an ethic of service to meet the needs of that people. That's it. Health systems are all about people. And at the core of that encounters is an empowered population, empowered by knowledge, because people are co-producers of their own health, and are a set of health professionals 
that working with the non-professional part, the community health workers, actually interact with the population to meet the needs. We should never forget the human core of universal health coverage. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Frank, thank you very much. I think you've really challenged us to think differently about what we mean by, uh, by health professional education. The challenge of supply and demand is so immense, though, that gap between the two. I wonder whether, in your heart of hearts, you, you think it can be fully bridged by the kind of approach you're talking about, or should we accept that there might always be a gap to some extent? You know, if we are serious about universal health coverage, I can tell you from personal experience, having you know, led a very, very ambitious reform, we did all the calculations, the financial calculations, we developed the package of interventions, we persuaded the President, the Minister of Finance, and the Parliament to approve a law. We got a major increase in funding. All of that was very hard. The hardest part of the implementation of the reform was dealing with the health workforce issue. This is the core of the health system. We need to take this seriously. It is painful to see countries where you have communities without doctors. These are typically rural, poor communities, and doctors without jobs who are typically located in, 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 in urban areas. We've got to solve the quantitative and the qualitative uh, lack of fit. Okay, thank you. So it's a vital part of the whole argument. Thank you so much you. for everything you've shared today. Dr. Julio Frank, thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, We've heard a lot already today on the first day of WISH, and there's still a choice of policy briefings on offer this afternoon. So one is learning from international collaborations. Uh, the other is led by the Health Affairs Journal, which is a WISH partner, and it's going to be looking appropriately at universal health coverage. So a very good follow-on from what Dr. Frank um, said to us. And there are two other policy briefings that take place tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, directly before the first plenary that will be in here. Uh, one is on deliverable, affording, affordable cancer care and the other on dementia. And the plenary will be at nine o'clock tomorrow morning when Professor Larry Summers will be talking to us about the returns, the economic returns from investing in health. So thank you all very much for a very productive first day here at WISH and I will see you at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.